Okay, so the next topic that we are going to talk about is about the different types of transports. Please listen here, please. The different types of transports that happen or occur in our cells. The go-to slide for me, at least, is ignore this for now. The go-to slide for me is this slide right here. This is the go-to slide. It tells you the different kinds of transports, and I'm going to use this slide as a summary slide to describe everything that has to do with diffusion here. So if you understand this slide, you are a to a okay with this topic. All right. So let's go through it. There are two kinds of transports, passive transport and active transport. The difference between the two is in passive transport, you are not using cellular energy. When I say cellular energy, I mean ATP, adenosine triphosphate. In active transport, you are using ATP, cellular energy. But the thing is this, there is energy being used in passive transport it's called potential energy. The energy of the gradient itself. Catch it. These guys will move, the, the molecules will move from high concentration to low concentration. In passive transport, the molecules move from high concentration to low concentration, and it's designated by the number of spheres here compared to the number of spheres here. Do you see more of them here? Yes. Than here? That's high, that's low. So that is what we call with the gradient. When molecules move with the gradient, you don't need energy to get them to do that. The energy that they're using is called potential energy. You don't need cellular energy, ATP. It's the energy harnessed in the system, the gradient itself. This is equivalent to you being, again, on a bike on top of a hill. You don't need to pedal as you're going downhill. It's the potential energy being converted to kinetic energy that's getting you to go downhill. So these molecules will move from high concentration to low concentration, that's called down the gradient, using potential energy, not cellular energy in the form of ATP. Yes, sir? Um, I still don't get it. Why is potential energy? Exactly? Potential energy, for example, is this. Watch, see this notebook right here? Yes. Potential energy is also, a fa height factors into potential energy. Listen to it, listen. You hear that? Versus this. Which one was louder? The, the second one, right? Yeah. Because that's potential energy. The, the higher this notebook is, the more potential energy it has. Potential energy is this. It has the potential of falling, right? As it's falling, it's called kinetic energy. So the higher the notebook is, the more potential energy it has. All right, so yeah. for cells... Uh, it's a concentration. It's a concentration. So on, on a high concentration, those, um, part, those the substance will move to a lower concentration. Exactly, exactly. It's sort of like you being on top of the hill with the bike. Yes. And it's very easy to fall downhill, you see? You don't have to spend any energy. A lot of times when you do it, you even stick your feet out because you don't want the pedals to hurt you, right? Um, sometimes you even have to brake because you can't go too fast, out of control, if the hill is steep. It's similar to that kind of idea. These molecules will move from high to low. I don't need energy in the form of ATP, okay? So the energy that is being used is the potential energy itself, the energy harnessed in the grain. So because of that, that's called passive transport. Because of that, that is called passive transport. Now, these molecules can go through the membrane directly only if they fulfill certain criteria. You gotta listen to this. You know it's on the exam. It's so important. I'm telling you, it's on the exam. This molecule is about to go through the hydrophobic phospholipid membrane, well, it can't be charged and it can't be polar either, you see? Because if it's charged and it's polar, then it's hydrophilic. If this is charged or polar, then it's hydrophilic. And hydrophilic cannot interact with hydrophobic because they don't like each other. 
So if this is a sodium ion, it cannot go through the membrane directly. If it has to be not charged and small, it has to be both. For the molecule to go directly through the membrane, it has to be both of those things not charged and small and the key word is and it's not enough to be uncharged it's not enough to be small you have to be both of them and only then will that molecule go through the membrane and i mean through the membrane it's sort of like if i wanted to go through the wall what do i have to be Best friend? A ghost, right? I have to be a ghost. We know we, know we saw as kids as ghosts, uh, Casper the ghost, right? He can easily go through the wall because he's a ghost. I tried to go through the wall and I got hit. I, it hurt really bad because I'm not a ghost. I pretend as if you believe in those kind of things, right? So there's a criteria for this molecule to go through the cell membrane. It must be... Small, Small and charged. Charged. not charged. It has to be both. You had a question. Go ahead. Uh, I forgot what the hell I was oh, <laughs> Write it down next time. Anyways, it'll, it'll come to you. The other thing that allows, the, the other thing that is allowed through the membrane is something that is hydrophobic. If whatever it is, is also hydrophobic, and this is hydrophobic, hydrophobic likes hydrophobic. So it will allow it through, like steroids. If this is a steroid, it will allow be it will allow be it will be allowed to go through the cell membrane. Yeah, oh, yeah I remember. Go ahead. So like what you said, it cannot be charged because the the fatty acids are hydrophobic and they don't attract each other. It's because they they repel. The hydrophobic does not like the charged molecule, and the charged molecule does not like it back. That's how they uh, interact. That's why they're hydrophobic. Right. They're hydrophobic because they do not allow charged molecules to go through. Because charged molecules will have water molecules. Exactly. Right? Charged molecules need water, polar molecules, to dissolve in. All right. But this is fatty acids. They don't like each other. Very good. Uh, is there a difference between like the, the ones next to it? Or... I, I'll get there. Oh, okay. I'll get there. Yeah. So we're talking about this one first. It is obviously moving high to low. But the thing is, the molecules are going through the membrane, through the phospholipids, and into the cell. Those molecules have to be small and not charged, or steroid, like a, something that's hydrophobic. Anything that is hydrophobic would be allowed to go through. So the, your book calls it diffusion. I'm going to call it simple diffusion because that's the actual term of this. I want you to add the word simple to this. It's simple diffusion. So one type of passive transport is simple diffusion. Molecules simply going through the phospholipid bilayer. Those molecules have to fulfill a criteria. They have to be small and uncharged or they can be hydrophobic steroids, right? That's why you can put a steroid cream on your cell and then it, it, whatever that is, the itch goes away because that simply diffuses through your cell membrane. Because it's going high to low and there's no ATP being used, that's one type of passive transport. Now, my analogy for this is if I take you to the edge of a river, let's say, I, hey, come over, let's watch, let's look at the river together. <laughs> and I push you in. I hope you know how to swim. If you know how to swim in the water, that's You're equivalent to this. That's equivalent to this. Listen, if you know how to swim in the water, that means you're interacting with the water. That's like this. Mm. Well, what if you don't know how to swim? Well, you better, and you want to go to the other side. Well, you better get on a boat, right? Otherwise, you'll drown. That's this one. So this membrane protein creates a channel. It literally creates a channel that allows ions to go through. So if you're like a sodium ion, you're charged. You cannot do this. You cannot swim 
in the sea of phospholipids. You can't because you're hydrophilic and the phospholipids are hydrophobic. But I want to get to the other side. Well, you got to get on a boat or go through a channel. You ever drive up north in New York? Anyone? You ever get, take a tunnel? Yeah. You know some of those tunnels are underwater, right? Did you get wet? I hope not. <laughs> so that's equivalent to you being in the car going through the tunnel. You know there's water outside, but you're not interacting with it. You will go through the tunnel and get to the other side dry, hopefully. You're not interacting with the phospholipids. The sodium ion is going to go through a channel, a sodium ion channel. It has to go through the channel because the sodium ion is hydrophilic and it cannot interact with the hydrophobic fatty acid tails. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, um, these kinds of proteins, you said it, they, they are these kinds of proteins. What are they? Membrane proteins. Membrane proteins. These are integral membrane proteins. This one happens to form what looks like literally a tunnel, a channel. And the sodium ion is like your car driving through that tunnel. It's amazing. It doesn't react with the, with the phospholipids. Just like when you go through that tunnel, you don't get wet, I hope. The reason it has to be facilitated across is because it's hydrophilic and the environment here is hydrophobic. Or in the case of the river analogy, the reason why you need a boat is because you can't swim in the water. So this is similar, this is similar to a boat getting you across the river. It's facilitating your movement across the liver, river. It is helping you cross the river. That's facilitating. Means helping. I am facilitating your learning right now. I am helping you learn. I am your facilitator. Your instructors are your facilitators but of learning. In this case, you're facilitating diffusion. The facilitator is the channel protein. It's facilitating the diffusion of sodium ions, for example, across the membrane. Why? Because it's hydrophilic and the membrane is hydrophobic. It's still high to low. So it is also passive transport. Yes, sir. So, Professor, so knowing that, that that's a protein and the uh, particle pa molecules that are charged and hydro or hydrophilic can go through that, that must mean the that channel, the little tube, the inside must must be in a way that doesn't interact with the molecules. And nice, or, nice, nice. We're not going to get into that. Very good thinking, but we're not going to get into that detail. That's more for another class. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's another class. Yeah. Versus this one. This one is a carrier of the molecule. So you know that boat scenario is more like this. Because you're sitting in the boat and the boat is carrying you across. That's more like this. This is more like the tunnel in Manhattan, you see? Does it really matter either way? Either way, you're being helped across. Whether you're being carried across or you're going through a channel, they're both called facilitated diffusion. They both are passive transport, high to low. Yes, sir. Is there like a difference we have to know between the tunnel one and like the boat? Tunnel? Well, this one here you call it a, a channel protein. And this one here, you call it a carrier or transporter. But when, the, when it comes to diffusion, it's the same idea. Watch this, high to low, passive transport, using a carrier, a channel protein or a carrier, the facilitator. This is the facilitator, and this is another kind of facilitator. Are we okay with this one before I yes. complicate mm -hmm. it? All right, it's gonna get a little tougher. Okay, what if I take you to the same river and I push you in and you decide to do, you can do, you can do one of two things. Number one, you can decide to lay on your back, if you know how to do that in the water, and go with the flow, right? Wherever the current takes you, that's where you're going. That's this one, passive transport. If I take you and throw you in the water and you decide, I'm not gonna swim, I'll just go wherever the current takes me. That's passive transport, because you're not using energy. And then I take you the next day and I throw you back in the water. This time you decide, you know what? I'm going against the current. I know the current is going this way. 
I'm gonna go this way. Well, you better put some energy, energy into it. That's you swimming now. This is going against the current. Mm -hmm. When you're pushing ions from low concentration to high concentration, that's equivalent to you swimming against the current. In this case, against the gradient. The gradient is always high to low. When I say with the gradient, I mean high to low. When I say against the gradient, that means low to high. Well, to take ions against the gradient, you have to add cellular energy in the form of ATP. So you still have a carrier or a transporter. You're still using a facilitator here. The only difference here is that you're going low to high and you're using ATP to get the job done. That's called active transport. That is active transport. Hmm. Here's an example of active transport. The sodium potassium ATPase, uh, other books call it the sodium potassium pump. If you look at it here, I can tell this is active transport in two ways. Number one, the concentration of the sodium inside of the cell is low, outside of the cell is high, and the sodium is leaving the cell. So it's going low to high. That's active transport. What's the other way that tells me active transport, active transport, active transport? The ATP. There you go. That's me going like this. See, active ATP. So the use of ATP and the fact that the ions are moving against the gradient, it, this is screaming active transport. So look at it. Three sodiums are leaving the cell through the expenditure of ATP against the gradient. It is active transport. But while the protein is open to the outside, it picks up two potassiums and brings them into the cell. So three sodiums are leaving and two potassiums are coming in. So the net loss is plus one. Are you catching it? Three pluses are leaving, and two pluses are coming in. So how many pluses are you losing? Yeah. One. So what ends up happening here, this is something you're gonna learn later in another class, a &P, physiology there, is that you end up getting a positive charge on the outside cell membrane in the environment here versus a negative charge here. Because of that imbalance, oh. the outside membrane will be positively charged compared to the inside membrane will be negatively charged. And that's how your nerves work. And that's not good? No, no, it's actually very good. You need that to survive. Mm. Because your nerve impulse does this. You're positive, you're negative. You're, this is not on the exam, okay? Thank God. <laughs> this is physiology. So you're positive here, you're negative here. When the nerve impulse comes, it flips those two. And then you, you become negative outside, positive inside. And it goes like this, flip, 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 flip. And then after it passes, it flips, flip, 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 flip back. And it is quick. It's quicker than that. It's super quick. And again, physiology will teach you all of that. But this is the way that sodium potassium pump is designed to set that up have a positive and a negative waiting for the inner impulse to come through. If you did not have that, you would not have a successful nerve impulse and we're in trouble. Everything about you works through a nerve impulse. Do you agree? Like Everything about you. Like pain and all that? Everything. You're controlling your heart, your kidney, your liver, everything is, your brain controls everything through nerve impulses. So look how important this sodium potassium ATPase pump is. Okay, another important one is this guy. You need to listen to me. I, I think I, I have a group of people who are listening to me here today. Okay. Good. Example. But additional, listen, listen to me even more with this one. If, if you miss this part, you will have a very difficult time understanding chapter 9, which is cellular aspiration. And chapter 9 is difficult enough as it is. Don't miss this, please. 
What we have now is another example. This is called the proton pump. It is active transport. I can clearly see it's active transport. Why? Because it's using ATP. ATP and low to high. You see how we do that? So I can give you a picture on the exam and ask you, what type of transport is this? You look for clues in the picture. Because pictures speak a thousand words, right? Well, here's one. This is definitely active transport. Actually, it's actually called primary active transport. I'll tell you the difference between primary and the other one. What do you think the other one would be? Secondary. Secondary, yeah. So you have primary active transport and you have secondary active transport. The primary active transport is this one. The one that uses ATP. That's primary active transport. You just listen to the parts, the pieces, and I'll put them together for you. The secondary active transport is a type of active transport. It does not use ATP. It uses the energy harnessed by the primary active transport. I'll, I'll explain it to you. Okay. I'll explain it to you. All right. Listen to it. The secondary active transporter uses the energy produced or harnessed by the primary active transport to get things done. You may not understand it, even though you do it every day with your cell phone. At night, what do you do with your cell phone, I hope? Charger. You put it in the charger, yeah? You put the wire, you get it charging. That's primary active transport. You're charging your battery. Right now, what are you doing? You're doing secondary active transport, using your cell phone's battery to get things done. See? When you have your cell phone plugged in, where is the energy coming from? The wall. The wall. Right? The socket. And that would be equivalent to this. You're charging your battery. So is this. This is charging the cell's battery. What the cell need a battery? Hang in there. This is my example. Hang on. You'll listen, listen to it and it'll make sense. As the hydrogen ions go across the membrane against the gradient, you will have more hydrogen here than here. Do you agree? Yes. Good. And you can clearly see that in this here. Look at that. It's positively charged out here versus negatively charged in here. Why? because there's more hydrogen here than here. Yes. So now there's an imbalance, but it's a charged imbalance. And that's why this is called the, the electrochemical gradient. Here's the word. Electrochemical gradient. So the primary active transport establishes the Electrochemical gradient. It is a gradient. A gradient is a difference in concentration across the membrane. That's a gradient, that's for sure. Here's a gradient. It's a difference in concentration across the membrane. But a difference in concentra concentration of what? Of a charged molecule. That's why it's the electro. You know, if it was just a chemical, then it would be chemical gradient. But because it's charged, it's called an electrochemical gradient. That's your battery. Because what, you, what are you trying to put in your battery? More energy. Charge, right? It's similar to the battery on your phone. I have to relate it to something that you normally use on a daily basis. There's no really tiny battery inside your cell, of course. It's the electrochemical gradient. So when this pump, it's called the proton pump, why? Because this is a proton. H plus is called a proton. And that's what it's pumping. It's pumping H plus. To establish the electrochemical gradient. This is no different than you charging your cell phone at night. Now, after you charge your cell phone, what do you do with the battery? 
during the day, um, you take pictures, you send text messages, you go online, you make phone calls, you do different things with your phone. Do you agree? Yeah. It's the same thing. Once you have the battery charged, what's the cell going to do with this battery? Different things. First of all, it'll stay alive Good. using this battery. So here's one example. This is what feeds into this one, secondary active transport. The secondary active transport does not use ATP. Look at the secondary active transport. It's this one right here. Do you see it using ATP? This one right here. No. no. It's this one that's using ATP, but that's the primary active transport. So look what happens. It's the primary active transport uses ATP to pump hydrogen against the gradient, establishing the electrochemical gradient, the battery. You see? For this guy to work, it doesn't need ATP. All it needs is to use the battery. That's like you right now with your cell phone in front of you. You don't need to be plugged in all the time. You get plugged in to charge the battery, then you take it and you use it the rest of the day. So this guy is using the stored energy established by the electrochemical gradient. It's amazing how this works. So how does this one work, the secondary one? Well, it knows that the hydrogen is gonna come back into the cell. The hydrogen will come back into the cell. Sucrose will hitch a ride along with the hydrogen. Nice. So the hydrogen has its own transporter, this one, but sucrose comes in along with the hydrogen. So it's called the hydrogen sucrose co-transporter. So for sucrose to come in, it waits for the electrochemical gradient to be established, and then when the hydrogen comes in, it hitches a ride, you see, on the same transporter. <clears throat> so let's say, for example, I block <coughs> this. Will the sucrose come in? No. It will not. Because the sucrose does not come in unless the hydrogen comes in. It's sort of like talk, calling your friend, I'm not going to the party unless you come with me then if your friend doesn't go, then you don't go, uh, assuming you live up to your promise, right? Mm -hmm. This is sucrose saying, I'm not going in unless you go in with me. Well, that means for the hydrogen to go in, I have to build this concentration here first. You see how that works? So the electrochemical gradient established drives the cell to do many things. This is just one thing. Amino acids can come in this way to make what? Amino acids build up making proteins. proteins. Other things can come in through into the cell using the same battery power. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, sucrose is like the, it's like the main fuel for the cell, right? Am no, I sucrose correct? is your table sugar, but your cell can break it down into two. Glucose is the main one. That they use it as main fuel for ATP. For right? making ATP. It's so really glucose. when using the ATP for the pro pump, pump and then put and then getting the sucrose with the hydro hydrogen um, to come in, so it's getting more ATP, potentially getting more ATP. Yes, than because we, we'll talk about it in cellular respiration. <clears throat> when we take the glucose and break it down, we make a lot of ATP. A lot. Yeah. Mm. That's a different chapter there. All right. Pretty soon. Oh, it's coming. Yeah. So let's do it real quick again. The primary active transporter is the one that uses ATP and goes against the gradient to establish the what gradient? Electro the electrochemical gradient. gradient. That's the battery charge. Now I can use the battery. It's a, just an analogous. I can use this charge, this energy harnessed in the system to drive different things. One of them is this co-transporter. All right. All right. Now, there are different kinds of transporters. I have to introduce this to you. There are different kinds of transporters. There are, obviously, you can see one that has two things going in the same direction. See this one? That's called the SIM porter. When SIM? SIM, S-Y-M. When two things are going in the same direction, that's called the SIM porter. S-Y-M porter. What's co-transport? Well, it's co-transport. That means they're moving together. But the idea is they're moving together in the same direction. SIM porter. Yes, sir. 
So that right there, is that like, can that be considered like a psycho, a cycle that like never ends? It'll go in, it'll go out, so then come back in and then repeat? Oh yeah, yeah, for the hydrogen? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you'll always have this established hope because okay. it drives many things. So it's like, sort of like you always have your phone charged because okay. you're always using it for different things. This one, only one thing is moving in, the, in, the, in one direction, right? Mm -hmm. It's called a uniporter. When one thing moves in one direction, it doesn't matter which direction it's moving. Yeah. I'm talking about one thing moving. That's called a uniporter. U-N-I-P-O-R-T-E-R, uniporter. <laughs> okay, look at this one. This was two things moving in opposite direction. Two things moving, but in opposite direction. That's called antiporter. Antiporter, opposite direction. So you can tell there are different kinds of transporters. The one that's moving one is uniporter. The one that's moving two things in the same direction is a symporter. The one that's moving two things in opposite direction is an antiporter. And how? What example can you show us? This this is an example of that. Oh, yeah. It just it just it, it just first then the first the yeah one goes out and, and one comes in. Exactly. And I will show you other ones as an exercise. Let's go back to this slide because there's something going on in this slide that is so important for your understanding. And if it's important for your understanding, it's on the exam. Yeah. There you go. You got me now. All right. Water moving. You know water is very important for your cells, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. There's no way your cell is gonna say, I will only allow water to come in one way and that's it. Well, what if that way is blocked? Oh, your cell is in trouble. That water actually comes in through, into your cell in four different ways. Oh. One is, two of them is more, you get a lot more water out of two of them than the other two. So let's review them. And you're gonna make a list. And if it's a list, it's on the exam, all right? Number one, water will sneak in through the phospholipids. Phospholipids. Because, because of their fluidity. Remember, the phospholipids are fluid. They're always moving around. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. I know water molecules are polar, but they're small enough to take advantage of the phospholipids moving around, and they sneak in. Yeah, water molecules are pretty small. Yeah, they're very tiny, but they can sneak in as these guys are moving around. Remember, they can move laterally or flip-flop, right? This is lateral, and flip-flop is between the two. Which one was more common? Uh, lateral. The lateral. And they're always moving, always moving. And the water can sneak in through as they're moving around. But this is not one of the best ways for water to enter. You're not gonna rely on this to hydrate your cells. You're not gonna rely on that. Because very few water molecules enter the cell that way. The brave ones. Yeah, the brave ones, there you go. Number two is a more common way. You're not gonna rely on number one. I would actually rely on number two more. They have their own channel called aquaporins. They have a channel that looks like this, just for water. And they're called aqua, get it, water? Porin, channel, pore. Aquaporins. Aquaporins. So they have their own channels. So I would rely on this one for sure. That's how a lot of water enters your cell, through aquaporins. Can okay. it be blocked? Say? Like, can it be blocked temporarily because yeah, it of can. Yeah, it uh, can be controlled. Uh, osmosis? Osmosis and uh, concentration of gradients and so forth. All right, now watch this, number three. We have to remember ions to figure out number three. Let's say sodium ion. How is sodium ion dissolved in water? Through the formation of? Hydration shells. Hydration shells. There you go. There we go. Hydration shells. 
and then another one, right? And another one, and another one. And another one. And another one. It's a shell. It wraps all the way around the sodium. It's a hydration shell. So watch this. For sodium to enter the cell, it has to go through a channel. It's called the sodium channel. It's facilitated. Sodium is gonna enter through a channel. Do you really think it's the sodium that's entering or the whole thing? The whole thing. It's gotta be the whole thing. The sodium is dissolved in the water. It's the whole thing that's entering through the channel. Yeah, so that. that's number three. Some water molecules will enter through the channel, the ion channels, as hydration shells. But again, I would not rely on this one to get your cell hydrated. So let's review this again. One way is the water takes advantage of the phospholipids moving around and they sneak in. Another way, they have their own aquaporins. That's a good way. A third way, is because the sodium ion is dissolved in a hydration shell, when the sodium ion goes through its channel, it's coming with the hydration shell. So that's how water can also enter. What's the fourth one? It's coming. For me to put the fourth one in play here, I have to explain some things. Any comment on the test? Of course. All right. So all this time, we have been talking about small things entering the cells, like sodium and glucose and oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay, what about large things? What about proteins? They're too big. We saw that in the lab on Wednesday, the starch and the proteins got stuck in the bag. Do you remember that? Because they were macromolecules. So in a real life situation, how would something like, like that enter the cell they're going to be endocytosed into the cell. They're going to be engulfed by the cell. When the molecule is too big to enter the cell, the cell will wrap its membrane around it and engulf it. We've seen it before. Yes. It's phagocytosis, right? Phagocytosis. So, endocytosis is cell entering or entering the cell. There are three kinds of endocytosis, depending on on who's entering the cell. If it's food that's entering the cell, it's called phagocytosis, cell eating. If it's large quantities of water entering the cell, it's called pinocytosis. So what do you think number four is? Uh, pinocytosis. Yeah. Okay, if whatever it is you want to enter the cell has to have a receptor for it to come in, then it's called receptor-mediated endocytosis. The word mediated means help, across. You need a receptor to bring it in. Obviously, this is a membrane protein. Let me give you the analogy to this. I go shopping for my family. I bring food, it's in the car, now I'm parked in the driveway and I'm walking in with bags of food into the house. That is endocytosis. Entering the house but, or entering the cell, endocytosis. But because it's bags of food, it's this type, phagocytosis. Are we catching it? So if I have two bags of food and I'm entering the house with them, that is endocytosis of the type phagocytosis. Then I go back out to the car and I bring the orange juice and the milk. That's like eat, uh, drinking. That's this one, pinocytosis. I'm bringing in liquids into the house or the cell. That's pinocytosis. I know when I go shopping, my son sends me a message or calls me. My son's name is Ryan. And he says, Dad, make sure you bring the Oreos. <laughs> he loves Oreos. Oreos are I mean, he loves them, right? But he has this weird thing. When I come home, only he can bring the Oreos into the house. 
Maybe he hides them or something. I don't know. But I know not to, I, can't, I can bring him to the house, but I can't take him into the house. Only Ryan can do that. Not watch, watch. <laughs> Only Ryan can bring the Oreos into the house. You see? That is receptor-mediated endocytosis. Receptor is a protein, correct? Yes. So only Ryan can do that. So sometimes I bring the food, but Ryan is at school. So what's going to happen to the, the Oreos? They stay in the car. You see? How cruel. Yeah. So if Ryan is not home, or if the receptor is not there, whatever this molecule is cannot enter the cell. So it's a receptor, it's a protein. Yes, sir? The receptor one is not water, it's endocytosis is the one that involves water. Yeah, this one is the water. It does not require a receptor? No, it does not require a receptor. It just wraps around a large pool of water and brings that in. So I can wrap around a macromolecule, bring that in. That's phagocytosis. I can wrap around a large pool of water and bring that in. That's pinocytosis. The receptor one, you have to have this one on the surface to attach to whatever that is, Oreos, and bring that in. Uh, is, is, it bringing in is that where it's bringing in proteins? Or? No, whatever that is. This could be glucose, this could be something else. Yeah. It's, this is the protein. The receptor is a surface protein. So, we all, our, me and my family, we all eat the food and we produce garbage. And it's inevitable. I put the garbage in the bag and take it to the curb. I just did that today in the morning. That's exocytosis. Exocytosis is how your cell gets rid of garbage. And there's only one way to do this. I mean, there's, I mean, guys, if you were responsible for taking out the garbage, you make a big deal out of it. Oh my God, I gotta, it's, you just take it back to the curb. That's exotyto. There's only one way to do it. I'm trying to give you hint, hint. There are three different kinds of endocytosis, but there's only one kind of exocytosis. Taking the garbage out is taking the garbage out. There's no different ways of doing it. And you'll get the message when I ask you questions on it today. You'll see why I'm telling you this. So, right. exercise doesn't just take it out.